In this segment, we'll be looking at woodwind instruments. So as we look at them, you'll see that some of them aren't made of wood at all. So what's the deal? Well, except for the saxophone, which is a relatively new invention and was never made out of wood, almost everything that you will see was at one time a wooden instrument. The flute we have changed over time and uh, we, we have metal flutes, although you can also buy a wooden flute if you like. It has a different kind of sound as orchestras got bigger and we wanted brighter sounds than the, the uh, metal flute has a, can be more piercing kind of sound. So we've had some changes like that. We also won't see the same sort of consistency in how the sound is produced that we've seen in our other families. When we look at brass instruments, we know that the buzzing of the lips creates the sound. String instruments, the bow on the string or the plucking of the string creates a sound. Percussion instruments, you hit something, something happens. With the woodwinds, we have a lot more variety. So um, I'm not a woodwind player. I can sort of play and I will try to demonstrate a few things for you, but that's why we'll also give you YouTube videos of professionals so you can know what the instrument is supposed to sound like as opposed to what it sounds like when I play it. So let's start with the flute. The flute is the highest pitched uh, well, not the highest pitch. I'll take that back because it's got a little baby, a little baby brother, and that's even higher pitch. But it's the highest pitch of these things that you would see most of the time. So as you can see, it's not made of wood, not no wood anywhere in sight. It has lots of keys. Remember, all our brass instruments had either three or four valves or a slide. Pretty minimal um, mechanical things to go wrong with a uh, brass instrument, sort of dropping it on the floor and but bending it in half, you really can't hurt it very much. Woodwind instruments are very fragile. They have lots of keys, as you can see, all of these are keys. And there are lots of these things that we call rods. So um, those are bendable, so if you grab it wrong, you can bend that and break it. Um, there are also lots of little springs, and if the springs pop loose, there are just a lot of things that can go wrong with a woodwind instrument. So you'll see that they are very, very careful with their instruments. This particular flute, if you can see, some of the holes have holes and some of them are covered. And that's not unusual on any woodwind instrument. Uh, it has a lot to do with what has to push down things. Some, some keys actually push down two, as you can see that one. One key pushed down covers two holes. So obviously I can only have one finger there, so the other one's got to do it for itself. Um, so there, if you see flutes with ho open holes and not open holes, there's really no difference. Um, flutists um, can sometimes adjust the pitch a little bit if the hole is open by moving their finger a bit. So. Um, we call this the foot, and then we have the body of the flute, and then we have the mouthpiece, or the head joint, as they call it on the flute. So how does it make a sound? It wastes a lot of air, to be quite honest. To play the flute, to produce a sound on the flute, and we can do this without the instrument, it's basically, the physics of it is splitting a column of air, and so that splitting of the air is what causes the vibration. So we have a hole in the mouthpiece, and basically you're sort of blowing across it, and and into it at the same time. So you can see that I can create a sound with just the mouthpiece, and that's true of many, many different things that we have seen. So we add the flute back to it. It's held sideways. As I said, that's why we have professionals on the recordings for you. Makes me very lightheaded because there's so much air that gets wasted. But so played off to the side is the only woodwind instrument that is played horizontally, so that'll be easy to tell in the orchestra. This little instrument is related to the flute. This is the piccolo. Uh, piccolos can be sometimes like this. This one is made out of wood. It's a, a, like a, I think it's granadilla wood or something like that, um, a black wood. But they're also made out of metal, so you may see piccolos that look just like a flute except very tiny. If you look at the size comparatively, piccolo is about half the size of a flute. So if we know what we know about physics of sound, if, if it's half the size, that means it's going to sound an octave higher. So the, the flute is um, an octave lower than piccolo, piccolo is an octave higher. Let's see if I can get a sound out of this. And you can see that was kind of low because I'm not a very good piccolo player. Piccolo is very hard to play. As you can see, the, everything's very close together. You've know, you got to get all your fingers in this little tiny space. So um, very minimal movement. People with big hands have a hard time playing the piccolo. So those are the two woodwind instruments that don't have wood anywhere involved, unless the piccolo happens to be made of wood. 
Let's move now to the double reed instrument. This is an oboe. The way that you can tell an oboe when you see it in the orchestra or in the band is to look at the bottom because you can see it's sort of round. It has kind of an onion shape at the bottom. That's going to be different from the clarinet that we'll look at in just a minute, and then I'll put them side by side so you can see. So that's the, the first place you should look to see whether it's an oboe or a clarinet. The other place to look is on the other end, at the top. This is where the mouthpiece goes. So for a, a, an oboe, there's not a mouthpiece that you stick on. There's just the reed. So we call it a double reed because it is, in fact, a double reed. There are two reeds tied together, wound together with a bunch of, of um, string, wire, lots of different things that people use. Then it's all put into a cork, and then the whole thing sits into the oboe. So the instrument's here, and then you're, you basically you have your mouthpiece over here. So the oboe and, and all the other double reed instruments, because it has this double reed, has a very different sound. And if we're really lucky, we'll get one of my oboe reeds to work. Oboe, oboe players are always fiddling with their reeds. Even if you watch them during a concert, you may see them getting out little, little knives and razor blades and scraping and doing all sorts of things, or they'll, they'll have a whole box full of reeds. And it's just a really difficult thing to do because you never know whether it's going to work. Humidity affects it so affects the reed. And if you get the least little chip in it, and mine are pretty badly chipped, so that's probably why they don't work very well. Um, they're just very temperamental. So double reed players spend a lot of time doing uh, what looks like a construction work back there. Uh, go by their offices and they're, all, they're just working away. So we're going to see if I can get a sound out of my double reed here. So you can get a sense of the difference between it and the single reeds when we look at those. Okay, you can see that sounds sort of like a duck call, right? Um, what we have here is the two reeds that are bound together. They have a little space in between to vibrate, and so they're vibrating against each other, and that's how you get that particular sort of, I think of it as sort of a nasal quality to it. It's beautiful when it's on the instrument. By itself, it's not perhaps the most beautiful sound you've ever heard, but that's what makes a double reed instrument, and the oboe is the highest of those. There is a middle member of the double reed family called the English horn that has the same sort of mouthpiece. It's a little longer than an oboe and uh, has, has a sort of a tenory quality to it. All right, so here's our clarinet. As I said, we'll look at those together in just a minute. But if you look at the bell of the clarinet, you can see that it is really flared out, where the oboe had that sort of roundness on the bottom. So that's one big clue that it's a clarinet and not an oboe. The other is to look on the other end. And you'll see here that we have a mouthpiece attached already, that it, it's, it stays on. I'm going to turn this around so you can see what we have here. What I can see that I have here is that I have my reed on too high. In a um, single reed instrument, like the clarinet, this is our reed. It's just a piece of wood. Not double, just single, so that, uh, a different sound. So obviously I can't just go and make anything happen there. There's nothing to vibrate. Once I put that in my mouth, it stops vibrating. So the way that this works is that the reed is put on the mouthpiece, and the mouthpiece, I'll give you a quick look at it here. There's actually a hole here. There's actually a hole here. And so you put the reed over that hole, the, vib the reed vibrates over the hole, and then this, the vibrations can go down into the instrument. So placement is really important. And I, as I said, I had mine a little bit too high there. So let's see if we can get it back on. There we go. And again, I can play it. Whoops. I didn't get that on very well, did I? Okay, try that again. See, woodwinds, I told you, they're just a lot of work. It's always something that can go wrong. And if you watch um, woodwind players in the orchestra, you'll see that several of them have multiple instruments that they have to play. So if you're, if you're a flute player, you probably have a flute and a piccolo sitting at your stand. If you're a clarinet player, you may have two clarinets that to you and I in the audience look exactly the same, but one is actually a half step different from the other and they have to keep switching back and forth. All right, so let's see what kind of sound we can get here. Good and loud, isn't it?
doesn't it? Yeah, that, that makes a nice loud sound. So you can see that it's not doesn't have that kind of edge to it that the double reed has. And once we put it on the instrument, and that's our clarinet. I'm a much better clarinet player than I'm a flute player, obviously. All right, now let me put these two together. So here we have clarinet on this side, oboe over here. You can see that the bottoms are different. And when you get them side by side, it's really easy to see that, that the clarinet is longer. It's also a little bit thicker. So that's not quite so easy to see. Maybe if I turn around, you can see that better. You can see that the body itself is a little bit wider on the clarinet than it is on the oboe, which may, is part of why it has a deeper sound because the physics there, bigger, bigger instrument, bigger sound. You also see that the oboe appears to have lots more keys. That they can they can all play all the same notes, but sometimes it just the um, mechanics of it require more things to push and and pull. So, clarinet, flared bell, mouthpiece on the top, oboe, rounded bell with a reed sticking out of the top. All right, now let's take a look at some of the bigger woodwind instruments. All right, now we're going to take a look at the big members of the woodwind family, and what I have here is the bassoon. So you can see that it's way up there already, and it goes all the way down here. So this is a large instrument. It's played sitting down, and it actually has a strap that would attach to it that I, if I had one, I would be sitting on so that I don't spend all my time trying to support this instrument because it's large, it's very heavy, and it's unbalanced, so it wants to go away from me. So you will see bassoonists sit down and you'll see them adjusting things underneath themselves. That's why they're trying to keep their instrument um, on their body with them. So here's our mouthpiece. Um, I don't actually have a bassoon reed, so I can't stick one on there for you, but this is called the vocal, and the reed would attach here um, in much the same way that the double reed attaches to the oboe, where we just sort of stick it, <clears throat> stick it in the end. So here's our vocal in the place mouthpiece we go, so we would play it like this. So as you look at the front of the instrument, you can see that there really aren't a lot of things on the front. Uh, I've got a few places here to put my fingers. If my hands were larger, I could probably do this better. I stretch them out, and there are my hands. It, you can notice right away how, how big it is because on the other all the other instruments, my hands were close together like this, and now they're just stretched all, stretched all over the place. So, um, But not a lot of keys on the front. Remember, all the other instruments we looked at were just covered with keys. That's because most of the keys are actually on the back of the bassoon. So you can see that there are lots of things to operate back here. And these are all done with the thumbs. So a bassoonist has to really be uh, flexible with their thumbs. They have to play a whole lot of keys here, a whole lot of keys here. So if you're watching them play in the orchestra, you may not see much action happening here, but you can bet there's a lot of action happening on the back side of the instrument. So this is the bassoon. It's not even the biggest of the double reed instruments. There is a contra bassoon, and I think there's even a contra bass bassoon, so they can get really, really big. If you see somebody um, in the orchestra who's who is physically towering above the rest of the orchestra because they're having to sit on a stool, that's probably one of those contra bassoon kinds of things because they're so long. I mean, you can see now that this almost you know, doesn't hit the floor behind me, but it's pretty long. You make it much bigger, there's no room to go. So they sit on a stool and go way up in the air. So if you see somebody really tall, you'll know they're playing one of those larger members of the bassoon family. So that's our lowest double reed. We've already seen some single reeds. So now let's take a look at um, the bigger double single reed instrument. This is the newest member of the woodwind family. As I said before, it's not even made of wood, never has been. It's made of metal. This is the saxophone. So why is it a woodwind instrument? It's a woodwind because it still makes sound the same way a clarinet does. It has a single reed on a mouthpiece. This is vibrating and that's where our sound comes from. So that's why we call it a woodwind and not a brass. So as we look at the saxophone, we can see that it's got a very large bell compared to the other instruments we've seen. As we look at it this way, we can see that there are a lot of keys, but none of them have open holes over them like we saw on the clarinet or oboe or even on the bassoon. They all have some sort of large cover on it. That's because the hole itself underneath that is so huge, you could never cover it with your finger. So all the saxophones have pads like that that will cover the, um, the holes on the instrument. So 
Uh, you're not going to hear the or the saxophone in orchestral music very much. It's as it's a fairly modern invention. Comes around in the late um, 1800s. Hasn't really kind of worked its way into the orchestra. It's used for special effects um, in um, Mussorgsky's Pictures at an Exhibition. There's a movement where there's a saxophone solo, so the poor saxophone player has to sit there on the stage for the entire long piece just to play their one little movement where they have the big starring moment. Uh, saxophones, like all almost all woodwind instruments, come in multiple sizes. So we would have a smaller one, which is the instrument Kenny G plays, the, the soprano saxophone. It kind of looks like a metal clarinet. It doesn't have this kind of bell shape normally. We have the alto, which is this size. Then we have the tenor, which is a little bit bigger. We have the baritone, and then we have the bass. So you can see that we're using those vocal ranges as our defining things to tell us what kind of range the instrument is in. We also have the, the same kind of size differential in um, the clarinet. So we have the little tiny E-flat clarinet. We have the B-flat clarinet, which is the one that you've seen. We have alto clarinet. We have bass clarinet. We even have contrabass clarinet. So all those instruments come in different sizes, which is nice because then they can play in choirs. You could have a whole choir full of clarinets that would go from soprano right down to bass, and you could play you know, pretty much anything because you've got all the, the voice parts covered. So now that you know what all the instruments look like, Go to YouTube and watch the video so you can hear what they all sound like and really get a sense of what those instruments, um, how to distinguish them one from another so that when you're listening to big pieces later, you'll be able to pick them out.